Highway planners, designers, and builders have been aware for a long time of the necessary disruption of the environment caused in part by the still present need for highway construction and repair. Intense public concern has accentuated this awareness, especially in places where consideration of prevailing environmental factors in reconstruction can provide the best return for more highway users. During unusually heavy spring storms in 1969, a section of Route 39, a scenic highway leading into a Southern California recreation area, was severely damaged by several rock slides. One of the slides, in a steep, narrow canyon, completely obliterated the roadway. The granitic debris from this slide covered the roadway and the narrow canyon below. Because of the extent of the slide scar, several conventional methods of repair were at first considered. Building a bridge on piers which would extend through the slide debris to firm footings. Removing a portion of the slide debris and replacing it with a stabilized fill structure or building a fill structure on top of the slide debris across the gap in the roadway. After several months of considering and rejecting the conventional methods as being either too disruptive to the area or economically unsound, a highway research board paper appeared. It described a new system of reinforced earthwork reported by a French engineer, Monsieur Henry Vidal. The method provides a means to rebuild the roadway over the slide debris without disruption of the area beyond the already slide scarred slope. Also, the project would provide California's transportation laboratory engineers an opportunity to study the behavior of the system. In this mountainous area, use of the reinforced earth construction is particularly adaptable since the recreational aspect of the area requires that the finished fill construction be ecologically pleasing to the highway user. The reinforced earth fill was constructed on top of a random fill embankment founded over the slide debris foundation. A system of surface and subsurface drain pipes was installed to remove surface and seepage water. At the bottom of the slide debris, a tow buttress was built to act as a stabilizing embankment. The overall height of the system is approximately 360 feet. The reinforced earth fill has a maximum height of 55 feet and a length of 528 feet. To understand more about reinforced earth and how it was adapted for Route 39 project, let's look into some of the basic theory elaborated by the transportation laboratory engineers. When reinforcing strips are stacked between layers of a soil mass, the skin friction developed between the soil grains and the surface of the reinforcing strips will create an arching action in the soil mass. The multiple rows of reinforcements will create numerous arching actions in a vertical plane through the soil mass to act as reinforcing wedges, which greatly increase the internal stability of the soil mass. The reinforcing strips are connected to the skin plate sections which form the outer face of the wall. The skin plate sections provide restraint of the soil layers directly behind the skin plates and between the reinforcing strip layers. The skin plate material 
must be sufficiently rigid to resist outside shock or impact, yet must be flexible enough to tolerate a certain degree of deformation when the soil mass settles under loading. It must have sufficient resistance to corrosion to endure the design life of the project. The skin plate shape used by Terra Army, the French firm, is a semi-elliptical element of galvanized steel, three millimeters or one eighth inch thick, 10 to 13 inches high, and from 36 to 45 feet long. The basic mechanism of a reinforced earth embankment can be explained by Rankine's state of stress theory. Assuming that an element of cohesionless soil mass is acted on by vertical and lateral stresses, the soil element will be compressed. If the stresses are equal, the element will be compressed equally in both directions. However, if the vertical stresses are greater than the lateral stresses, vertical compression and lateral expansion will result. When the lateral strain reaches a critical value, the element of soil mass will fail by shearing along a failure plane. A triaxial compression test indicates the same mechanism on test sample material. The state of stress at imminent failure condition can be described by a Moore diagram in which point A represents the state of stress where sigma 1 equals sigma 2. In order to hold the soil element from failure, the lateral stress sigma 2 must be increased. By providing a reinforcement in a soil element, the skin friction of the reinforcement will supply additional lateral resistance to hold the soil element from excessive lateral strain. This additional lateral resistance acts as an imaginary end plate at each end of a soil element to prevent failure. The effect of this increased lateral restraint provided by the reinforcements will change the state of stress to a stable condition, as shown by the stress circle which is well below the strength envelope of the soil with its internal frictional angle. The state of stress developed in a reinforced earth embankment may vary from an at-rest state in the inner portion of the embankment to an active state near the face of the embankment. Using the state of stress indicated, it can be assumed that the maximum frictional forces needed to hold the soil element from failure is equal to the active earth pressure. The frictional forces developed along the skin of the reinforcement is then resisted by the tensile strength of the reinforcement. Thus, the reinforcement must have sufficient strength to resist the earth pressure. The basic equations indicate that the tensile force in the reinforcement is directly proportional to the vertical height and horizontal spacing of the reinforcements. The determination of maximum allowable vertical and horizontal spacing of the reinforcements is still uncertain at the present time. However, it can be assumed that the reinforcements must be closely spaced so that an arch action can be developed within the soil mass between the reinforcements. This arch action, which causes the soil particles to link together without separation, may depend on the size of the soil particles the skin friction between the soil and the reinforcement, the internal frictional angle of the soil, and the state of stress developed within the soil mass. To summarize, reinforcements must have sufficient length to develop the frictional resistance required to preclude slippage out of the soil mass. They must also have sufficient cross-sectional area to preclude failure in tension. Because the influence of all unknown factors is difficult to determine, the only way of selecting the maximum spacing of reinforcements is through large-scale model tests and field performance studies. 
However, past experience has shown that rather small-sized reinforcements at relatively close spacing, five feet horizontally and one foot vertically, are sufficient. To simplify the stress analysis of the skin plate elements, a semicircular section of skin plate with an assumed soil pressure and deformation configuration was used. The vertical load, which represents the resulting force transferred from a vertical pressure acting along an effective length of reinforcing strip will cause a vertical deformation. The vertical deformation is assumed to have the same magnitude as the settlement of the mass caused by a uniform vertical soil pressure acting on the top and bottom row of reinforcements. When the end connection of the reinforcements to the skin plate is assumed to be hinged, only the vertical load need be solved. However, when the reinforcement connection to the skin plate is considered to be a fixed end connection, an additional unknown, the value of end moment, must be solved. For design purposes, a value of vertical deformation can be estimated from settlements based on field observed data or from previous experience. The equations developed here will be verified by measuring strains and thus stresses at selected points on the skin plate and the vertical deformation in field performance studies and laboratory scale model tests. The overall stability of a reinforced earth embankment under all prospective loading conditions should be analyzed by considering the reinforced earth mass as a solid block or a gravity type of concrete retaining wall. Possible sliding instability and earth pressure developed within the backfill behind the reinforced earth mass and the potential sliding or bearing failure of the foundation should all be investigated in the same manner as ordinarily done for design of embankments and retaining walls. As a rule of thumb for safety considerations, the ratio of depth to height of a reinforced earth embankment is suggested to be in the range of 0.8 to 1. The footing for the reinforced earth embankment is recommended to be embedded in an excavated or a backfill berm to one-fifth the clear height of the reinforced earth embankment. The berm width should be at least five feet with an outer slope not steeper than one and a half to one. The detailed analysis of this project on Route 39 has been reported in the January 1972 Highway Focus. The durability of the steel reinforcements and the skin plate material is one of the major concerns in design of reinforced earth structures. In general, the life expectancy of the steel strips is governed by the rate of metal loss due to corrosion. R.F. Stratful, Transportation Laboratory Corrosion Engineer, has developed a method for estimating relative soil corrosivity, combining the relative influences of the hydrogen ion concentration, pH, and the resistivity of the soil. The chart shows the relationship between corrosion rate, the soil resistivity, ohms per centimeter, and the pH value for acid soils and alkaline soils. A thorough investigation of soil samples and the corrosive environment for a given construction site is strongly recommended. Laboratory and field soil tests should be conducted to determine the various factors which affect corrosion. Total thickness of reinforcement should allow for the estimated corrosion losses within the design life of the facility. In certain cases, should the construction soil prove to be excessively corrosive, cathodic protection should be considered. Reconstruction at the slide area on Route 39 began in November 1971 with the partial stripping and compaction of the bottom of the slide debris for placement of a stabilizing tow buttress. A random fill embankment was found over the slide debris up the slide scar face.
Fill material for the random fill embankment was excavated from a borrow site, one and one half miles from the construction site. The fill material is composed primarily of weathered gneiss. Laboratory tests indicated an internal frictional angle of 40 degrees. The Rankine's coefficient of active earth pressure was calculated to be 0.22, and the at-rest earth pressure coefficient was 0.36. Skin friction laboratory tests on the reinforcement steel were conducted using a specially designed shear box. A skin frictional angle of 31 degrees was found between the soil and the steel reinforcement strip. The elements of reinforcing steel and skin plate were purchased from the Reinforced Earth Company of France, Terra Armée. A system of drains were installed in the slide debris and behind the reinforced earth embankment to remove surface and seepage water from the embankment system. As the random fill embankment progressed up the slide debris, slope indicators were installed at pre-planned locations to monitor movement in the slide debris and the fill embankment. Construction of the reinforced earth wall began on August 1st, 1972 when the random fill embankment reached the 6,353-foot elevation. The fill area was leveled with approximately a 1% slope downward away from the face of the wall. Batter boards were erected at approximately 10 foot spacing to provide initial horizontal and vertical control for positioning the skin plate elements, which are laid up against the batter boards and brought to a precise level using wooden wedges underneath the skin element. The reinforcing strips were laid out perpendicular to the alignment of the skin plates on the compacted fill. Each strip was bolted to the skin plate element. Wooden wedges were driven between the skin plate elements to tilt the elements inward toward the fill. As the fill was placed and compacted against the upper edge of the skin plate sections, the skin plate elements were forced outward to a plumb position. The correct amount of cant inward determined by trial and error turned out to be about one half inch. 
At each end of a skin plate element, a one inch gap was provided for expansion. Connection plates were attached at each end of the sections to prevent the soil behind the skin plates from sloughing. Three skin plate elements were erected before the first 10 inch lift of fill material was placed and compacted. A three skin plate height was maintained above the last compacted fill layer to provide sufficient resistance to the outward forces during fill compaction and to serve as a safety barrier at the wall face. Compaction control of the fill material was maintained using a nuclear density gauge to determine the compacted density of the fill layer. To monitor the behavior of the completed reinforced earth structure, a comprehensive instrumentation program was designed and implemented. These instruments included slope indicators to measure the internal movement of the embankment and slide debris. settlement platforms to measure vertical settlements in the soil mass. Extensometers to monitor soil strain. Soil pressure cells to measure soil stresses on three directions. Strain gauges on the skin plates and reinforcement strips to measure stresses developed under loading conditions. Gauge points located on the face of the skin plates to measure deformations of the skin plates and also to show deformation of the wall face. The instrumentation elements were placed in trenches located in selected levels and locations of the reinforced earth fill. The instruments were selected to accurately monitor deformations and stresses of the reinforcing strips, the soil mass, and the skin plates. The reinforced earth fill was completed on October 18, 1972. All instruments were read periodically during construction and for approximately one year after completion of construction.
After reviewing the field data obtained from the different elements of instrumentation, the field performance gave the research engineer several clear indications. It was concluded that the measured settlement of the reinforced earth embankment is primarily attributable to the densification and the slight horizontal movements associated with the deep foundation slide debris. These foundation settlements and horizontal movements are probably the main cause of continuing change in stresses of the steel and soil after the completion of the fill. The differential settlement between the center portion and each end of the reinforced earth embankment are the primary cause of axial tensile stresses in the skin plates. It has been proven that continuous steel skin elements are very effective in linking the reinforced embankment into a monolithic soil mass. This monolithic action helps the redistribution of the horizontal movement along the alignment of the reinforced earth embankment. The measured vertical soil stresses generally agree with the calculated theoretical vertical earth pressures. The stress ratios between the horizontal and vertical soil stresses were highest during construction, then decreased after completion of the fill with large variations from point to point. The measured stresses in the reinforcing steel strips near the wall face are generally smaller than, but approach the calculated theoretical stresses as based on Rankine's active state of stress theory. The highest steel stresses were developed in the inner middle portion of the reinforced earth section. The steel stresses may increase to the value corresponding to the theoretical at rest earth pressure. The strains measured in steel reinforcing strips and soil generally agree with each other. However, the converted steel stresses are mostly smaller than the horizontal soil stresses, a phenomenon which is probably due to the mechanism of the soil arching action. The structural behavior of the skin plates closely followed the design assumptions in deformed shape and stress values. The vertical deformations of the skin plate, which is a measurement of the settlement within each skin element, are proportional to the overburden height. Field pulling test results recorded as the test strips were pulled loose indicate that the load deformation curves resemble the stress strain curves obtained from laboratory triaxial compression tests on dense sands. The yielding peak and residual load points are all clearly defined. The frictional forces developed on the steel strips are proportional to the overburden load for each overburden height. The field measured skin frictional angle agrees well with the laboratory test results under equal overburden height. The equation for design of reinforcing strips developed by the transportation laboratory engineers for this project has been verified. The use of the active earth pressure coefficient for calculating the steel stress is applicable for the end portion of the reinforcements. For the middle portion of the reinforcements, the coefficient of at rest earth pressure should be used in design. The relationships between overburden height, strip length, and factor of safety against slippage developed for the project can be used for determining the minimum length of reinforcement providing the requirement for stability is met. Design equation number three developed by the transportation laboratory engineers for the skin plate design accurately predicted the stresses developed in the skin plate. Using the vertical deformation of the skin plate for one of the major functions in design has been proven to be an adequate approach. The assumption of a semicircular shape simplified the calculations of the stresses in the skin plate and accurately predicted the measured stresses. 
Construction cost comparisons were made recognizing that the project is the first of its kind in the United States and was located in a relatively remote area with limited working space. Cost data may not represent present day construction in a more accessible site. The reinforced earth fill construction used only normal construction equipment and usual labor services. No special equipment was required. Construction costs include skin plate elements and reinforcing strips imported from the reinforced earth company of France, Terra Army, at $750 per ton. The price includes patent rights, packaging, custom, duty, delivering to job site, and required services in review of design and supervision of construction. Borrow material is a contract item and presently costs $1.80 per cubic yard, excavated, graded, and delivered to the job site. Erection of the skin plate elements, placing and compaction of the fill material were paid by force account. At the time when equipment and labor were mobilized at the highest work peak, the unit cost of compacted fill was at the lowest cost of $3.50 per cubic yard of fill, and the total unit cost including labor, equipment, steel, and fill material was at its lowest cost of $7.40 per cubic yard of fill. Comparing reinforced earth fill construction to three standard types of retaining walls listed in California Division of Highway Standard Plans of 1971 shows that the reinforced earth fill can be less expensive than any of the three retaining walls. These statements and conclusions reflect the views of the California Transportation Laboratory Engineers who are responsible for the facts and the accuracy of the data as presented. The statements and conclusion do not necessarily reflect the official views or policies of the state of California or the Federal Highway Administration, nor does this film constitute a standard specification or regulation. <laughs>